Tribal Health and Human Services Department of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes is proud to present Good Medicine, a program dedicated to the wellness of the Flathead Nation. The mission is summarized quite simply, a healthier people, a stronger nation. We will strive to make Good Medicine a reliable source of ideas and information about health issues so that everyone can make informed decisions about their own lifestyle and health care. You will meet health professionals, tribal government and spiritual leaders, and interesting people from the tribal community discussing important health issues that profoundly affect us all. Hello, this is Good Medicine. I'm your host, Larry Pitts, and today I want to say this is very astutely. I have a very you know, desirable, honorable guest with me. He's Dr. I mean, <laughs> Chief Craig Couture, there and he's go. the uh, Chief of Police for the, for the Tribal Law and Order. And uh, Craig, I've been waiting to get you on here. About a month ago, I talked to you, and uh, you are a very, very active, um, busy man. And uh, um, you've been in the law enforcement for how many years now? Just coming up on 10 years. 10 years. So now, why did you become a police officer? It's actually a fairly long story. And first of all, I'd like to say, I mean, it's my honor to be here. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm privileged to be here today. What happened is, when I was a young child, my grandfather, who was actually the original IO2 here, he was killed in the line of duty. Mm -hmm. And I never got a chance to meet my grandfather. And I remember one day I was talking to my mother, and I asked, how come I don't have a grandpa on this side of the family? I wanted to know. And she said, well, you know, grandpa's passed away, he's gone. And, she explained to me, you know, how, what goes on with that, and I kind of let it go, and then a while later I asked, well, you know, what did Grandpa do? What, what, did, you know, what did he do? And it's like, he was a policeman, and he died in the line of duty. And I remember telling my mother at the time, when I grow up, I want to be a policeman. And, you know, a lot of twists and turns within my life, and, you know, my, I had a brother who became addicted to methamphetamine, and I worked around a lot of people through when I worked in the plywood mills that were addicted to methamphetamine. And I just, I seen what that drug can do to people. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know what? If I'm gonna be working around people who are using drugs and in this situation, I wanna be doing something to better the community. So my goal was to help my brother out and to make a difference in the community. And I became a law enforcement officer. And mm -hmm. I think one thing I remember, you know, still to this day, one thing that keeps me going is when I was a little kid saying, when I grow up, I wanna be a policeman. And I'm proud to say it, and here I am today, and I'm the chief of police. I've worked hard to get here, but it's because I work around a lot of great people. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of great people I've worked with, and I really enjoy my job. And it's, it's interesting you said that because it's a process, isn't it? I mean, it's sort of like a, a clock. You got the second hand, it's got to tick 60 seconds before the minute hand moves. Exactly. The minute has got to move 60 minutes before the hour hand moves, and it's, one doesn't come before the other. They all worked in conjunction together. Yes. And you, you had a plan, you had a vision, you had a dream. I did. And you know, and that's one of the things I see with our kids out here right now is we got to start to develop more dreams into them, more hope. And uh, when we're talking about that, um, what would be your most memorable moment as a police officer? As far as memories, the one thing that sticks in my mind, it's not a good memory, of course. Mm -hmm. It's when we were doing a drug raid in the Polson area. And we'd made entry just like we normally do in full SWAT gear. And as we made entry into the house, there was a gentleman, and his, I like to say gentleman, use that term loosely, mm -hmm. on the floor sleeping with his children. And as we made entry into the door, he grabbed his little baby from, and used the baby as a shield to cover himself as we went by. And he was taken into custody and he was interviewed later and during the interview he said that he wasn't sure if it was bad guys coming to raid his house and steal his drugs or who it was. He just grabbed his child instinctively as a shield. And that's a memory that's, that's etched within mm. my mind that will never go away. That's a tough one. That's a tough one. And uh, um, So I can see how that would affect you professionally. It made me really, it made me realize, and this is something that happens quite often in drug work, is there comes a time when you get really cynical and you mm -hmm. think, why do we even do what we do? Mm -hmm. And I look back on that day and think, you know what, we were the voice for that child that day. 
we're, we're the voice for those children and the people out there being abused in, in, in domestic cases, in drug cases, in whatever other kind of case we deal with murders and whatnot. We are the voice for those people. If we can't do our jobs and do them efficiently, then what good are we? We're the voice. And there's no boundaries in life. Exactly. So now, how does this affect you personally in your personal life? Well, being a law enforcement officer, you know, in most jobs when you go home at night, it's over with. Mm -hmm. You go home, you, you know, take your suit off or whatever you do and you're, you're fine. But in a law enforcement type job, in any law enforcement job, you pretty much take your work home with you. Mm -hmm. And it's really tough because there's a lot of things that, you know, if you're having a bad day at work because there's a confidentiality issue, you can't talk about work at home. Mm -hmm. So all of that stays inside you. So you can't talk about it, it just builds up. And the one thing that's really helped me it, throughout my life is faith in God. And if it wasn't for that, I don't think I could make it as a law enforcement officer. That is something that, that builds me strong every day. Mm -hmm. Well, you can, uh, you can always take it to Him. Excuse me? You can always take those problems exactly. to Him. And uh, now, so I can see some areas that were really tough to deal with. What are some areas that you really like about your job? Doing the presentations within the schools, within mm -hmm. the public, and getting, getting the word out there and letting them know that, that we're there to serve them. Because mm -hmm. I think there was a time frame within law enforcement that you know we take an oath to protect and serve the public and the people. And I think we get too much arrest oriented mm -hmm. in, in law enforcement. And I think that if we, we look to protect and serve the people, that means if someone has a flat tire on the side of the road, pull over and help them. You know, just helping the public, getting out there and seeing there's a lot of good people out there. Get, doing the presentations and getting to talk to people afterwards and say, man, it means so much that you guys are out there doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Just the, the public interaction and with the children as well. I know there's a few kids in the area that, you know, we've been able to influence their lives by what we do. They look up to what we do. And yeah. I think being, a, being a, a role model for these children, in a lot of times they don't have role models, is very important. Well, you have one officer I know that I've seen many times when I'm driving down the highway and the hood is up on the car with somebody on the side and he's in there. You can see him doing things because he yeah. knows cars well. And it's, it, to me, it's a tremendous witness. It is. And, you know, great public relations and it goes a long ways. Now, off the air, we're talking about, you know, your history in law, law enforcement. Yes. And you were in Idaho for a while. Yes. Want to tell me about that a little bit? Well, I started out as a Benoit County Reserve. And when I was hired full time for the, re for the Benoit County Sheriff's Office, I was the first Native American hired within that jurisdiction. And uh, Benoit County is split in half by the Coeur d'Alene Indian Reservation. So it was actually a pretty big thing for me to be hired there. And at that point, I started with the department and I got assigned narcotics right away. And it was like, boy, this is overwhelming. What do I do? Mm -hmm. And my partner and I worked really hard to make a lot of good cases. And it kind of was my niche. It was what I really liked to do. I like the overall portion of law enforcement, but narcotics seemed to be where I was headed. And I did a pretty good job at mm -hmm. it and worked with a great guy that taught me a lot of good things about law enforcement. But Benoit County Sheriff's Department, you know, working with that agency, working as a county officer on a reservation. Mm -hmm. And now I'm on the flip side, I'm, I'm the tribal officer working with an, on a, in a county as well. It brings that and bridges those gaps a lot better. I think that's huge in our area. Now, are you seeing that gap starting to bridge a lot? I am, and I work really well with the sheriff, and I think with the working on the drugs in this area, too, I had a lot of contacts as far as the DEA, FBI, ATF, the county, the state, and whatnot. I worked with a lot of the counties around, and I think by doing that, you know, you, you build a personal relationship with people, and they know that some, you're someone you can, they can trust, they can trust your agency, trust your guys, and it, it builds that. It builds that, that rapport that you need in law enforcement to get the job done. We've had cases within the last year We've had some of the homicide cases that come in our area, and we worked hand in hand solving those cases with the county. We've, we've been involved from start to finish. Without that kind of a teamwork in our area with the law enforcement, we wouldn't be near as successful. Now, I've heard on the street from just different people that um, you know, we're highly um, supplementary. Our, our cop cars are, seem to be almost better cop cars than the county's cop cars. We have better equipment inside. Is that true? Well, what happens is, is we've been successful in, in securing grants, mm -hmm. and those grants are where we buy our, our equipment. Our, a lot of our, our law enforcement equipment, our vehicles are 100% grant. That's, that helps a lot. Mm -hmm. But with the uh, recent cutbacks on COPS grant funding, that's an issue we're going to have to deal with. These cars may have to last us a long time. Mm -hmm. So we're going to make do with what we have. But right now, we do have some of the best equipment around. And it's always, it's always nice to know that your, your people are well qualified, that they have the yes. right um, stuff backing them. 
And, and all of our guys are Montana certified. A mm -hmm. lot of the guys have different certifications, both BIA and Montana. Like myself, I hold Montana and Idaho certification. So we have a lot of our officers who bring a lot to the table. Mm -hmm. We have a, a very well-trained department. Well, I've noticed in the past a lot of times you have some very qualified like jailers. Yes. And that they're waiting to go to, you know, law enforcement school over in Bozeman or yeah. wherever it's at. In Helena. In Helena now that I knew they moved that so I could remember where they moved it to. And they go and they get that certificate, yes. that training, and then they come back and you must have a lot more confidence in your people that way. Yeah, once once they go to the school, they learn a lot because there's only so much we can teach them. And then they go and they sit in front of a bunch of professional instructors who show them the ins and outs of the job. I think it just adds to it, mm -hmm. adds to the professionalism we're trying to bring to the table. Okay, you were saying you you really enjoyed you know talking to kids, to groups, yes, you know, out promoting what you do and what your department does. So, what, what sort of groups do you talk to? Well, I've talked to the job service in Polson area that, that brought us in. We've talked at the Ronan School, the St. Ignatius School, Polson Schools. I had a meeting at Pablo School a few years back. I've spoken in front of the Tribal Council and in the quarterly sessions there. I spoke at Walla Walla College was another one. And just anywhere we can get, I have one coming up actually tonight where I speak with uh, the Awanas at the Baptist Church. I'm going to do a talk with them. and my faith and my job and just everything I do out there mm -hmm. and the officers do. And you said you had two different talks going on tonight. Why would that actually, be? It's actually the same the same one, but two different groups, two right. kids. The real young kids and then the, the little older group. Right. The young kids are always really fun to do. Right, they got, got good questions. They look at yeah, and I have another one coming up actually in March where it's for the Cherry Valley School, mm -hmm. for the parents for the Cherry Valley School. You know, and I think, you know, the more information that's put out there, you know, the more aware that we are of different situations. Now, we don't have a drug problem on our reservation, do we? Oh, we have a bad problem with drugs on our reservation. And something that I think a lot of people are shocked is we actually broke it down one time to see what is going, you know, how much money is being spent on our reservation mm -hmm. every year. And just breaking it down, the easiest way to put it is it's nine and a half million dollars a year that's leaving our reservation and leaving this county every year. So what's nine and a half million dollars due to our local economy? Well, it'd be probably one of the larger chunks of money mm -hmm. in the area. Uh, if, if it was any of the big organizations, it would be right up there with what they make. So that's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. That's a huge chunk of our income leaving. Well, you know, when travel per capita has come out, I think it's $8 million a year. Yeah. You know, so. That'd be like all of our per caps going right for drugs. Right. And that is something we have seen, that mm -hmm. a lot of our, our organized crimes, let's say the... I hate to, to say one particular group, but we have a lot of Hispanic drug dealers that come in and out of our area. Mm -hmm. And some of them have figured out that the per caps are the best time to be here. In and out quick, sell a lot of stuff and move on. We do see that quite often. It's, it's called good marketing. It is. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are a lot of people with good business sense out there. Mm -hmm. They end up getting caught, but it's still how yep. much money's leaving. So now let's talk about the drugs just a little bit. We'll get started and we'll finish up a little bit later. But so. From your perspective, where is our drug problem? As far as overall in the state? I mean, you know, let's just make it more localized here on the reservation, here Lake on the, County. Here on the reservation on Lake County. Well, I can say this, in 2000, we led the state with the most meth labs seized within the state. Really? Yeah, we had roughly 63% of the meth labs came from our area, from and the reservation area. We have 27,000 people. Yeah. We have a state of 900,000 people. I say our percentage is a little skewed. Yeah, there's a, there's a big problem. A lot of it you see that we have a kind of a depressed economy mm -hmm. throughout the area, and that tends to kind of bring the drugs up. It always does. And in our area alone, the amount of drugs that we seized in one particular year, we seized six pounds of methamphetamine was our best seizure total. That was numerous well, that's cases. Much, it? That's what a lot of people think is six pounds isn't a whole lot of drugs. But if you actually break that down to what it can be used as when it comes to street value meth, you can get roughly 170,000 people high with that amount of dope. That is a huge now, chunk. 170,000 people can get high on that. There you go. And we got 27,000 people. That includes babies, grandmas and grandpas. Anyone that wants it. Yep. That, that is a huge number that is a to large see. Number. And that's after they would break it down and make it street level. It's not, they're not going to sell it at 100% at purity. They're going to knock it down a little mm -hmm. bit. That's how you get to the big numbers. Mm -hmm. Well, there's been a really change in purity level anyway in this area. There has. Want to tell me about that just a little bit? Well, we used to see most of our stuff that came off the streets between 12 and 20 percent pure, which mm -hmm. means it was mostly what they called CR or crank, and it was a, a low-grade methamphetamine. Now what we're seeing is the glass or the crystal, 
and it's fairly high grade. We're seeing it up in the 90 percent mm. as far as what it is, the purity level of that. What so, that does is you have a person who maybe was using X amount of, of drugs to get high for a day. Now with one administration of the drug, they can maybe be high for a full 24 hour period. And we've had some people we've arrested who said with one use that they're high for 24 hours straight. Of course, tolerance builds up and then it takes more and more of the same to get you high, but we're seeing a huge increase in the purity of the drug and the amount, the, the, the distance it'll keep them, I don't know what word I'm looking for, but the, the time it'll keep them high. Mm -hmm. Oh man, this is a little bit scary. It is. You know, I have a really bad habit, which I tell other people not to do, and that is I pick up hitchhikers. And, you know, I pick up tribal members and non-tribal members. And, you know, quite often we get talking about things like this, and, you know, they tell me that the um, drug usage in the non-tribal sector is as large as in the tribal sector on the reservation. It is. We have, from the cases that we do, roughly 50% are tribal, and the other 50% are non-tribal. Mm -hmm. And our numbers, as far as overall population, is down. We're roughly, what, a quarter, I think, of what the population right, is. Right, we're 27, 20... 7%, I think. Yeah. So we have, there, there's a huge drug problem here. It's not, it's not a Native American problem. No. It's, not an, it's, a, it's a human being problem. Right. It's, if you're out there, you're susceptible to the drug. It does, yeah. It's an equal opportunity destroyer. It doesn't discriminate. Well, before we take our break, I, and we're going to hit this, is tell me about the addictive qualities of, of, of meth. Well, methamphetamine, in what we've seen from interviews and talking to people that, you know, the people that use, is a lot of them say after the first time they were addicted. And actually I had a person sum it up really good that they were a cocaine addict for about a five year period. The minute they used cocaine, their cocaine problem was gone. The minute they used methamphetamine, their cocaine problem was gone, it was cured. It was that addictive. And mm -hmm. then they went on that cycle where it was a downward, downward spiral until mm -hmm. they finally got out of it. And you know, and that spiral is what we're going to talk about when we get out of this. Okay. When we come back after a break, we're going to take a quick break here at PSA Break with the Boys and Girls Club of America. So, viewing audience, don't go away. Come back with Greg and myself to hear the rest of this interview. For many kids, a brighter future is within view, not within reach. The Boys and Girls Clubs help kids cross the street to a better world. In fact, most of the kids here will go on to college, but there are still thousands more who need that opportunity. With your help, they can have a bright future instead of just seeing it through a window. Support a program that works. Support the Boys and Girls Clubs, the positive place for kids. And I'm back in that short PSA break for the Boys and Girls Club of America. So, great club, good way to keep your kids out of drugs, um, support them, you know, get your kids involved, five dollars for the whole year. So, I mean, you can't beat that deal. So, and as always, I thank uh, Jim at the hair for my free haircuts. And thanks, Jimmy, keep it cutting, keep keep it coming free. I like that, and uh, that's how I get paid for this program. And so we're talking with Craig, we're talking about drugs. Yes. And um, you said you were talking about you had some personal um, involvement yeah, in your own family. Yeah, for the family member. Yes, you want to talk about that just a little bit? Yeah, I, it's one of the reasons I actually got involved in law enforcement, one of the many reasons, I guess. And there came a time when I was dealing with my, one of my family members, I'm gonna kind of keep this a little vague. Right. And I talked to this person and, and it, the, the subject was that you're going to force the issue where I send you to prison for a long time or I find you dead. And it was actually my brother. And he told me, you're going to find me dead. And boy, that was, that was just a terrible thing to hear from him. And I made it my goal that I would probably send him to prison. And I never had to. He finally made it out of, out of that portion of his life and he's doing great and been clean for five years now. But it was devastating to see that because my goal was, you know, I'd much rather have this person in prison and probably hate me the rest of their life than to find them dead or mm -hmm. to have to deal with that situation. And I didn't know if he'd ever make it out, but he has, and he's doing great within his life. Well, and I, that's a uh, real kudo in your, in your court, you know, because to be 
to show tough love sometimes is, is really hard. It is. It is very tough to do. And you know, I see parents all the time. They just vacillate, saying, "Well, I can't do this because my 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 child's going to disown me." Exactly. And you know, but do you want your child to be dead? That's the thing. You have to make some tough decisions out there. And, and we, as parents, especially, when we're given an awesome responsibility within our lives to be parents, and you don't have to agree with what they do. You just have to to love them, mm -hmm. and get them through it. And sometimes making those tough decisions are what we have to do. Yep. And you know, and it doesn't. There are good families out there that have problems with drugs. Exactly. It, it doesn't. It doesn't discriminate. Rich, poor, black, white, yellow, green. Doesn't matter who you are. Right. It's out there. It's out yeah. there for everybody. Most people have heard of Billy Graham. Exactly. Billy Graham had that same talk with his son, who now runs, you know, Samaritan Purse and runs his own ministry for, exactly. for his dad. And so, you know, I look at that and I say, wow, I can't judge. But, you know, when we get in that situation, we have to start to, you know, address that problem. We can't just turn our back on it. And that's, that's one thing that was brought up, actually. I was at, I sat on the, a board down in Missoula with the Rural Advocacy League with the attorneys down there at the college. And one of the questions that was brought up is, what do we do with these people? What's going to, you know, do we send them to prison for the rest of their lives? What do we do? Bottom line, they're human beings. Mm -hmm. They're no different than you and I. They have a very serious problem. Yeah. Some people can make it out. Some people never will change. It's just mm -hmm. the sad reality of it. And the yeah. drug's very addicting. But we have to find something. We have to be there for them. Because the majority of the time when you deal with someone on meth, when they're on meth and they're off meth, it's a 180. They're yeah. different people completely. Mm. And that's something a lot of people don't see. They mm. only hear, and so they assume that most people are really bad people. They're not. They just got a bad problem. Yeah. I got a very good friend. I mean, awesome, awesome person who's got an addiction problem. Meth gets involved in there when he gets really bad, and you know what? I can't help him. No. You know, I can feed him. I can love him. You know, I told him, I, I pray the day he's, you know, that he dies, he's sober. Exactly. That he's not stoned, and you know, um, there's been a really, to me, an effective commercial that's been on, you know, on TV. Yes. You want to talk about those a little bit? Yeah, yeah. the Montana Meth Project. Actually, mm -hmm. Peg Shea sat on that same panel with the Rural Advocacy League down in Missoula, and she gave her spiel on the, the commercials, and I got to talk to her in person. And she's a great lady, and what they're doing with those commercials are, I think, leading the nation as far as meth awareness. I've heard some people comment that they don't like them because they're too graphic. I think in a situation with methamphetamine, you can't be graphic enough because it's the reality of it. The mm -hmm. commercials are exactly what we see in law enforcement. Mm -hmm. They're not pulling any punches, they're showing reality. Mm -hmm. And as far as reality, it, you know, it makes you look, it makes you really take a look at things. One right. time. Yep. You know, the CBS network out of um, the state did a thing about the meth problem in, in Montana. Yeah. And they had these three mothers who when they were, were highly addictive, they left the kids. Well, they came back, they had in a house in Billings. And it was so sad to me because during this, the taping of this, and after the taping, before it got shown on TV, the one mother had chosen to leave with a man who was back on meth. You know, um, the addictive personality, because I know how much my wife loves my kids. It's tough. It's huge. It's huge to see somebody, and I was just talking, matter of fact, right before I came over, one of my officers and I were talking about this exact thing, how you see somebody who will just turn their back on their children and their loved ones, and for me to actually think about that, about turning my back on my wife and my children mm -hmm. and leaving them for the drug, I can't imagine myself doing it. I just can't imagine what that could be like, but we see that over and over again. And plus it's so financially devastating because I see people who are doing well, who once they get into this. They lose everything. They lose everything. Their jobs, their families, everything. And then they end up, end up at poor, you know, Teresa Wall McDonald's job. Yeah. DHRD it, trying to keep the family intact. Exactly. The, the meth problem doesn't just affect just the jails and law enforcement. It affects the health care system. It, mm -hmm. it affects um, child protective services. It affects children. It affects schools. It affects every person on this reservation on this planet if, if they're involved. If you have not been affected by methamphetamine, you count yourself lucky because the time's coming. Yeah. Because it's going to be a family member. It's going to be a friend. It's going to be a friend's friend, but you'll know that person yeah. and you will be affected somehow. And you can imagine being a kid growing up in a, in a situation where they see things and then they're exposed to things that they shouldn't be exposed to. 
Exactly. And you know, you're talking about the medical. I mean, you can look at the jaw of a, of a meth user. The how many how many children out there, especially in these? How many children out there, especially in these drug drug induced homes? Let's say, have probably never been told "I love you." Mm -hmm. They've never been hugged. They've never been told "Good job." Mm -hmm. And then these children then grow up and have kids. Yep. It's it's a generation. It's different generations coming up, and it's getting worse and worse all the time. And I think that if we continually work hard at what we're doing in law enforcement and throughout, we can come up with a solution. Mm -hmm. And I think we're well on our way to doing it. We're making the cases, or we're making, I mean, we've seen 76 labs total on the reservation area alone, which is huge for the state. Um, we're getting a lot of good seizures in the area. I don't think it's because so much that, that our problem is worse than anywhere else in the state. I think we addressed it and we've been addressing it and we're gonna to continue to address it. And I think with the good prosecutions, with the law enforcement out there doing their jobs, we can, slowly take care of the problem. Mm -hmm. That's the goal. Work ourselves out of a job. Yep. It's interesting because you know, I stayed at the Marriott in Missoula last week. They wouldn't let me pay cash for my room. They want the... They want a credit card. Yep. And I said, well, well, I mean, if I got the cash right here, why... And they said, well, sir, are you got to be honest with you. It's because of all the meth labs. There you go. Happening. That way they have a receipt and a way to track it back. Yep. And it's like, meth labs are affecting Hotel rooms. Everybody. That's right. When you go to the store to buy Sudafed, mm -hmm. to buy a cold medication, you have to sign for it at the pharmacy in Montana. Mm -hmm. That affects a lot of people. So there's very few people out there that are not affected by drugs. Well, give me a PSA on what you're doing for about a minute. Got one minute left. I'm not sure what you mean by well, PSA. Well, PSA on, on drug usage and prevention. What we're doing as far as in law enforcement mm -hmm. or just? In personally, what you are personally. I'm getting the word out there. Okay. I think the biggest thing to do to stop the use of drugs and maybe prevent one, the way I look at it, every time I'm in the public eye and I'm doing a drug presentation, a drug talk, if one person, one person maybe makes that decision that's sitting on the fence thinking, you know, I might, I might not. But if we can get the word out there to one kid, one adult, somebody, then that person grows up drug free and their children maybe grow up drug free. And that's how we snowball effect it. Mm -hmm. I think we do it one person at a time. Yep. That's that's the underlying goal, one person at a time. Yep. And that snowballs. It snowballs into more. Well, Craig, it's been a great program. We are done. And so, you know, anytime you want to come aboard, I would love to have you. It's my honor my, to be here. It's my pleasure, bud. All right, thank so, you. So, hey, thank you. I'm doing Audience Sound. This is Larry Pitch from Good Medicine. Have a great day, and we'll see you next week. Good Medicine is your program. We hope you watch this and subsequent programs to stay informed about your health care. And we'd like to hear from you about how we're doing. Please direct any comments or suggestions you have to us. You can reach us at 303-566-1111.